Hey, well, it is a lovely day here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll tell you all that. Um, I want to say good afternoon to everybody. I want to welcome our friends, uh, our colleagues, our clients, and all of our industry professionals to our first Reno Top virtual event, Our Style Freestyle Get to Know David Wise. I'm Sean Tracy with Reno Tahoe. I'm the regional director of sales for the Southeast region of the United States. I am broadcasting, or should I say Zooming, proudly live from Atlanta, Georgia, and it is a beautiful, beautiful day here. I hope it's a beautiful day for you all also. So welcome and let's get started. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge and address what's happening in our nation and the world for that sake. Uh, between the pandemic and civil unrest, I know it's affecting us all personally, physically, financially, and more important, mentally. Uh, with that being said, I believe this is a time for us all to come together now more than ever to heal the pain and nurture each other in our combined cause for humanity that's associated with these crazy, crazy, crazy times we live in. Uh, I thought we'd do that, and the whole team thought we'd do that, by providing a forum to talk to one of Reno's hometown experts in personal wellness and personal victories on an Olympic athletic uh, level, Reno's own son, Mr. David Wise. Welcome, David. Hey, uh, thanks but for having before me. We, let me introduce my friend, my confidant and fearless leader, Vice President of Sales for Reno Tahoe, Mr. Michael Larragheta. Wow, thank you, Sean. It's, uh, it's gotta be the first time in my life that I got a, a bigger play introduction than David Weiss. That's pretty good, thank you. So again, thanks, well, Sean. And, th and thank you all uh, for joining us today. You know, Reno, just to echo Sean's comment, Reno is so fortunate to have David as our hometown hero. I'm uh, personally really looking forward to hearing what he has to say because I could use some wellness, wellness tips myself. So looking forward to that, David. Uh, that being said, I have some great news to share with everyone. As of Thursday, June the 4th, our casino hotels officially opened their doors. On that Thursday, myself and a few members of our staff, we went and visited some of these properties. And to be completely honest with you, I really didn't know what to expect. We had heard the stories of how different the hotels would look and how service levels would be in question. And I gotta tell you, we were all really pleasantly surprised. When you're near the hotel, your temperature is taken and the staff were all wearing the mask. Social distancing is in effect at the gaming tables, slots, bars, and restaurants, but service was outstanding. In fact, it even had seemed that the employees were a little bit more attentive than normal. In the two weeks since reopening, our occupancy levels are exceeding expectations. And based on this initial success, the hotels continue to open more amenities each week such as their spas, workout facilities, additional restaurants, pools, with 50% capacity restrictions in play, of course. Now, I must say, I think it's important to point out that in terms of the rooms, the 50% capacity rule does not apply. So 100% of our inventory, sleeping, standard rooms, suites, penthouses, are all available for sale right now. Our select service properties never closed, and their occupancy percentages and rates have increased significantly. May was up 45% in occupancy over April, and the average daily rate increased 9%. Probably the most important thing that I need to talk about today is, of course, safety and sanitation. All of our hotel partners in the RCBA facilities have implemented extensive safety and sanitation guidelines. If anyone would like a copy of any of our hotel partners' health and welfare reopening plans, please reach out to one of the regionals that's in your territory and on the call today, or visit our website at visitreno.tahoe.com where we have all of their plans listed accordingly. Like many destinations, we realize, we realize traveling for site inspections, fam trips, or hosted events is going to be put on pause for a while. Therefore, we have created virtual site tours with the support of Concept 3D. Concept 3D allows us to create interactive 3D maps featuring our hotels, facilities, and of course, Reno landmarks. We realize you can never substitute seeing and experience a destination in person, especially one like Reno Tahoe, but virtual custom tours designated to client specific needs and preferences is a great backup option right now. And I've saved the best for last. Our team in conjunction with all of our major hotel partners is rolling out a group bounce back program starting tomorrow. The anchor concession of this program is gonna be music to all of our ears, no attrition. 
The program is valid from July 1, 2020 through June 30 of 2021. And in addition to no attrition, all of our partners have listed additional concessions for their particular individual hotels. It's such a great feeling to have all of our major hotels come together to support Reno Tahoe, especially during these trying times. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce one of our sales superstars, Regional Director of Convention Sales, Mr. Charles Mullins. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and welcome everybody. We're really excited to be here today. Um, I am the Regional Director of Sales located over in Sacramento, California. And I represent Northern California, Northern Nevada, Oregon, Washington, and the great state of Alaska. Um, so if you need anything, please give me a call. And from here in Sacramento, I'll send it down to David in LA. Thanks, Charles. Good afternoon from Southern California. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm David Diomedes based in uh, Southern California, as Charles mentioned, um, handling the Southwest Territories for convention sales. Um, I'll, we'll head up to uh, the Rockies and check in on Alita. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. Alita Barrett based in Denver, Colorado. I handle all of the center states within the United States. So if you're based in the heart of the country, I'm your gal. Next up, I'll pass it to my colleague, Maddie. Thanks, Alita. Maddie DeMario here, based in Chicago, um, and I handle the Midwest Territory, so if you need anything, let me know. Hey, Jen, how's it going in D.C.? Hey, Maddie, it's Jennifer Abdenor here, Washington, D.C. area, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and everything north up to Maine. Um, really miss seeing you all, but thanks for joining us here today. Hey, what's going on in sports, guys? How's it going, everyone? Uh, Nick Sacamano, our national sports sales manager here, alongside Shelly Fine in our office. We represent the sports market. We're glad you're all with us today. Uh, with that, we're going to take it to our hour. Come on, Mark. Hi there. I'm Martin Jimenez. I'm Jamie Loken. We're small but mighty, but we're your tourism sales team. And we're here for you if you need any information or materials on Reno Tahoe. So just get a hold of us and we can point you in the right direction regarding our toolkits and webinars. And we're both in Reno. So anytime you need us, give us a shout. Thanks, Jamie. Well, thank you all for being with us today. Uh, do enjoy your visit with David. David is a, a, a chore, a, a chore, a, a treat to have with us. But I'm gonna kick it back down to our MC, great Sean in Atlanta. Hey, thanks. Back here from Atlanta. So I'm Sean Tracy, as I said earlier. And I represent the Southeast I'm from uh, North Carolina South and Tennessee East. So I'm the Southeast guy, but um, enough of that. I am uh, honored to be moderating this event with David Wise. Uh, David Wise is more than Reno Sons. He, Reno's son, he's a hometown hero. He's an international hero, Olympic gold medalist, medalist, X game medalist. Uh, before we begin this uh, portion of the event, I wanted to let everybody know that there'll be an opportunity for questions, if you could ready your questions in the Q&A box located on your screens, our Reno Tahoe rep, my colleague, Matty DeMario from the Chicago office, nice. will pose your questions after David, or if you have questions for anybody else on the panel. So let me read a bio really quick. Uh, Reno native David Wise is a professional skier, adventure seeker, a four-time X game champion, and a two-time Olympic gold medalist in half pipe skiing. At age 29 years young, and I believe he's like two weeks away from almost being 30 years old, uh, David is also a father too. He considers parenting his highest calling and credits his wife, his family, and his faith for his success and his ability to live a multifaceted, balanced lifestyle. Having grown up in the Reno, Tahoe area, David is more comfortable outside than inside. He competes in archery, rides mountain bikes and dirt bikes, teaches his kids to play sports, he hunts, fishes, and what he calls his giant Nevada backyard. Before we get to David, I want you all to check this out. There's almost this pressure, this anticipation that every year at the X Games, you're going to do the next big thing. The expectations get to be kind of overwhelming sometimes. It's not really sustainable. I can't always be setting a personal best or a world's best. I came into this season just with this fresh outlook where uh, every competition, even every practice day, instead of saying, 
what's the next best thing in skiing that I can do? I was more asking myself, what's the best thing I can do today? This has happened before for Wise. He's crashed on both his runs in previous competitions and come back and taken the victory. So an expert, a pro, four-time gold medalist, two-time Olympic medalist, David Wise. There's the switch, right side 720, so still playing safe up top. Into the double court, 1260 to the left. Here's that right side 1080. Can he get the switch? Left double court. Top Alex, it's gonna be a good score. Where's he gonna slide? 90.33. And Herrera takes the gold. Here it is. Second. It's been kind of a pleasure this season to just go into each competition, asking myself, what is my best today? How can I improve on yesterday? How can I gain momentum and make tomorrow even better? Wow. Without further ado, welcome, Mr. David Wise. How you doing, David? Hey, Sean, I think we may have lost David for a second. <laughs> oh, okay, well, that was a surprise we were expecting to lose me. <laughs> See? Okay. I can't imagine the adrenaline that that pumps through your body, uh, not only doing that kind of course, but uh, receiving a gold medal for your country. And for that's just, that is unbelievably crazy to me. So we'll wait a couple seconds and see if David gets back on here. There he is. There you go. Dude, that was weird. I swear, I swear, Zoom has it out for me. Yeah. You know what, David? It has it out for me, too. I was expecting it to happen to me. And all of a sudden, something rogue happens. Well, I'm glad you missed all the great things I said about you during that little time. <laughs> because now I don't want your head to get too big. So, listen, I was just telling the group that that must have been an incredible rush and so surreal, not only uh, – doing that run, but also standing up there for your country and receiving those medals. So I applaud you for your work and uh, your athleticism. And as I'm sure the whole team does, as well as probably the whole country and the whole world. I mean, that, that was amazing. So I'm glad to have you here, David. And I have a few questions for you. If you don't mind, we'll start that out. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any group? Oh, yeah. I'm just um, kind of jumping off of your, your point about the fact that um, I mean, it's a great honor, but it's also such a great privilege to be able to go and represent my country, represent my hometown, represent my home state, um, and just represent the people who believed in me along the way. And so um, both as, you know, people who live here with me in Reno Tahoe and just people, everybody who's on this call who supports Reno Tahoe, um, you guys are all part of my team now. So anytime you see me competing moving forward, obviously I'm, I'm making another run at the next Olympic Games, trying to make it three for three. So um, I just thank you guys for, for joining me in my journey here. And um, now you can say you're part of my team going forward. I love you. We got you. We're, we're behind you 100%. It's, uh, like I said, super exciting. And I can't imagine the training it takes to do that to most of us in the world. We sit there and we go skiing because it's fun to do a little run or to take your kids and play in the snow. And for you, it's all serious business, I'd imagine, in the training that goes into that. So thank you for repping us and thank you for making us part of your team, most importantly. Absolutely. So a couple of questions, David. Uh, tell us how you got started in your sport and what led you to, to pursue your Olympic dream. Yeah, honestly, um, I grew up in a skiing family. We, uh, I, I'm born and raised in Reno and we skied starting at Sky Tavern and then moved to Mount Rose. And my dad raced in college and my sisters who are twins that are four years older than me, uh, they both raced as well. So it was kind of expected that I would, I would follow my family down the Alpine racing path. Um, but I was just kind of an, I was kind of an aggressive kid. I like to jump off things. I like to take risks. Um, I would, I would try to make side money off of, you know, doing dares that people put me up to and stuff like that. Um, so I just, I kind of had that X in my, that extra, you know, some kind of extra screw loose in my head or whatever you want to call it. And some of my early success in free skiing was, was really ironically boldness based. Um, people ask me all the time, Hey, how did, how did you become so good at your sport? And 
I have to be honest and say that it wasn't skill to start with. It was just the fact that I would try anything. I would try things that nobody else would try. And nine times out of 10, I would crash. But that one time out of 10 that I landed it meant I usually won the competition on that particular day. So some of my early success was just purely boldness based because I was just just willing to go out and try new crazy things. Um, and then over time, I slowly refined the refined the process a little bit and got to the point where I could land run competition runs more and more consistently. Um, and it kind of snowballed. I, I honestly have I've accomplished more on a pair of skis than I ever would have expected, uh, sort of in different ways than I thought. For one thing, when I got really into free skiing and, and half pipe skiing, um, I wasn't sure I was ever going to get to go to the Olympics because the Olympics was skiing half pipe wasn't an Olympic event during that time. And I was just never, I, I loved it that much that I was willing to give up this Olympic dream. So then I got to be part of the first Olympic team and part of the, you know, that was that was a dream in and of itself and then winning the first olympic gold medal and winning the second olympic gold medal all of that just feels like some switch flipped and i entered like a new realm of unreality almost nice nice you know the city must i can't imagine the energy in the city when that happened once and then to back it up twice the, oh, the, man. i can imagine that was that was definitely my favorite part of the whole experience was bringing these medals home with me you know the first one obviously this is the first ever for the sport, but also it was the first um, native Nevadan to win an Olympic gold medal. So um, bringing that home to Nevada, bringing that home to Reno was spectacular. Um, and, and both times I would say my favorite part of the experience was, um, was bringing it home. Cause like I said, every, everybody who, everybody who lives in this country is part of, part of my team, but um, it's especially hits ho close to home with people that live here in Reno Tahoe. Yeah, I'd imagine that being the case with the, the pride that comes just from watching the games from a spectator into things and the pride that comes with counting the medals and, you know, when the United States wins something, it's got to be super elating for you. I'm sure they had a huge, huge parade or at least something waiting for you when you were on your ride back home. Yeah, the, the, the first time um, there was parades, there was all kinds of crazy stuff. And then the second time they had this huge, you know, like, well built event homecoming event and then my flight got canceled coming home so my wife and kids were up on stage without me saying thanks to the city and to the mayor and to everybody who showed up uh david's not here but i'm sure he'll appreciate this when we show him the video later <laughs> so yeah even, yeah that's a you know, tough break crazy things happen no now every flight's canceled <laughs> yeah yeah don't travel yet Flights aren't solid there. So anyway, uh, let me ask you, what, what part does your, uh, since you mentioned your family, what part does your family play in uh, your training and your outdoor life, uh, lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, most people ask me how, how I manage to balance my family and being a professional athlete. And um, for me, it's, it's actually kind of the other way around where my family is the balance. Because um, like any athlete or anybody who's extremely motivated on the business side or on the sales side or in anything that you do um i have a tendency to get over focused and i get a little too caught up in in my own realm and what i'm doing on a pair of skis and you know i'll kind of get stressed out about oh man like this this competition isn't going the way i expected it to or the way i hoped it would um so for me, my family is actually what kind of brings me back to reality because it's good to remember no matter how serious you think what you're doing is at the end of the day, there's things that are a lot more important. And so that's, what's been kind of a good balance for me on skis is um, no matter how caught up I get in the grind, I still have my kids to come home to at night who all they care about is if I'm going to hang out with them and play Legos. You know, like they don't care if I won the competition or lost. They're just like, hey, dad, good to see you. Let's play. And it just really helps me stay grounded and realize, OK, obviously, I'm going to give this everything I have. I, I there's no other option for me. I'm, I'm built that way. I'm, I'm just going to put all my chips on the table and let it ride. But if it doesn't work out the way I hoped it would, I still have, you know, like I said, something more important at the end of the day. So my family has been traveling around with me 
Uh, my wife has been traveling around with me for years and my, and my daughter pretty much from the moment she was born uh, started going to the competitions with me. So that's been pretty cool. And, and I'm, I enjoy bringing them along for the ride because uh, most sports stars kind of have their career and then have kids and they have to tell their kids about their sports careers. But um, because I had kids young, I get to share it with them and say, Hey, let's go. I mean, they're, they're in this experiencing it with me. They both got to go to the Olympic games and watch me compete. Uh, it's, it's a pretty unreal journey. Yeah. You know what, David, I love the fact that on the front end of it, you said, you know, I, you, know, you asked me how, how, how do we balance this and that, uh, what balance that, that actually my family balances me. That's kind of a beautiful thing. And it shows what kind of a family man you are. So that's, that's fantastic. I also have kids young and that's just, I, I think it's priceless. So you're absolutely right there. Let me ask you this really quick. Do any of your kids uh, ski or are playing in the snow or, or aside from snowing, from throwing snowballs, any of your kids following in your footsteps? Uh, yeah. Well, my wife um, is a snowboarder. And so pretty much from birth, she has tried her best to brainwash both kids. I think that even, I think that even while she was pregnant, she was uh, whispering, snowboarding is cooler snowboarding is cooler yeah. so uh both kids have tried skiing and snowboarding and um i think that maybe by not over lobbying for it i'm actually winning because they both like skiing better currently they both still do ski and snowboard which i ski and snowboard too so i'm totally i'm, I'm a multi-sport guy i respect that but they both if they had to choose one for the rest of their lives i think they'd still choose skiing which makes me just so proud Oh, I bet, you know, and plus, you know, it, it's kind of comfortable for them when they were really young to probably been able to have teethed on a gold medal, right? They could just put that in their mouth when they were teething and, exactly. you know, maybe your wife- Yeah, the metal is soft, didn't have that you know, kind of molds to their new teeth coming in. They're soft, perfect. gold, yeah. Yeah, nice, nice. Do you have a, a favorite ski resort? Do you have a, I mean, do you, have a, do you have a favorite course? Let's go that way, aside from the ones you want on, because I would inherently imagine that those would be favorites because of- the victory yeah associated um with. i have my, my favorite resort um i mean i love I, I actually got really into even with covid going on i got into you know exploring into the backcountry a little bit because um because i can reach it from where i live so um i love the mount rose wilderness right on the nevada side there but um my favorite resort growing up uh was alpine meadows that's where i that's where i joined the freestyle team that's where i did my first backflip that's where i you know that's where I skied my first half pipe. They actually don't even make a half pipe at Alpine anymore, but it's still got a, it's got a, still got a treasured place in my heart. Um, it'll probably always be my favorite resort just because I spent so much of my childhood. I feel like that resort almost raised me in a way. So that's, that's, that's home. Well, it's a beautiful place to be raised. You know, that, that it's a beautiful landscape out there, Reno and, and Lake, and Lake Tahoe. It's amazing. So um, let me ask you this. What, what is, what was the biggest os obstacle you faced during this time that we've all been sequestered at home or whatever you want to call that or pandemic or however you want to play with that as far as the COVID-19 thing was concerned what what was your biggest obstacle for that during that during that time this yeah, time that we're COVID kind of, kind of came on the end of uh what I felt like was the end of a, a really hard year for me anyways I shattered my femur uh in April last year so right like I want to say like you know, mid February, early March, I was really finally feeling a hundred percent again. I was feeling like myself and I was feeling like, I, you know, I was like, all right, these last couple competitions of the year are going to go are like, I have a good chance of, of skiing at the level that I want to ski at. And that's when everything got, got canceled. So that was unfortunate, but everybody had things canceled. So I can't just point at that and say, Oh, woe is me. My event, my sport got canceled when people are dealing with you know, loved ones who are sick that they can't visit it in the hospital and everything. So I've really tried to take this whole thing with a, just with an, a little bit of perspective because things can always be worse for somebody than they are for you. So it's definitely been hard. And, and honestly, for my wife and I, um, we've spent more time together in the, in the last couple of months than we probably have, like, at least in terms of time in a row spent together. We've actually spent more time in a row together this, these past couple of months than in our entire 10 year sub marriage. So there's been some serious upsides uh, kind of along with the downsides. 
certainly for me, um, I can't help but identify as an athlete. And a lot of that comes down to training and traveling and competing. And all of those things got pulled out from underneath me. So I kind of had to redefine who I was as a human. Like, okay, wow, I, the gym is closed. Uh, all the trampoline facilities that I usually train at are closed. Okay, all the mountains are closed. Okay, not even like all of the training, spring training camps are now canceled. Wow, summer training camps are canceled. Okay, I have no idea what I do for work anymore. Um, so it's been, it's been really interesting, but I think um, the, the huge benefit that I'm walking away from is realizing even with all that stuff gone, I still have a lot of, of things to be thankful for. And I still have an amazing family and, and being able to get outside and, and spend time adventuring with them in the outdoors has, has been amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to wish for another COVID to ever happen again because it's been rough, but, um, but I'm also going to take some lessons with me into the future for sure. Oh, that's great. So on a couple of notes there, shattered femurs. So how does that affect, uh, you said you're almost back at 100% with that and the healing process is pretty much done with that. So we, you don't expect it to affect any of your future performance? Yeah, I, mean, I still am dealing with pain in my leg on a daily basis, but it's getting, it's getting less and like, it's just over time, it's getting less and less. Um, honestly, the main thing, your bones do a pretty good job of healing. And so I kind of expected them to be, I expected my leg to just be fine by six months later or whatever. Um, but all the soft tissue damage that comes along with, um, cause I spiral fractured the bone and put it in a couple different pieces. So damaged all the muscles and ligaments around it. And then they had to put a rod in there to stabilize it, man. It was, it was a traumatic, uh, recovery for sure. Um, so I'm still dealing with some pain, but I'm also, uh, when you, when you've walked through a season like that, kind of like we're all going to say, when we get, when we get to the backside of this COVID-19 thing, we're all going to be able to say, wow, I survived that that makes everything else seem a little less bad, you know? And, and, and that's kind of how I feel about my leg is yeah, my leg still hurts, but man, it does not hurt nearly as much as it hurt a year ago. Um, yes, I'm still dealing with a little bit of muscle weakness in some places, but I feel strong compared to how I was six months ago. So, um, you know, life is all a matter of perspective and you have to look at everything that you, that you go through and, and rather than being bitter about it and saying, Oh, this has been such a hard time. What was me say, wow, this is a hard time. I'm thankful for the struggle because I get to add this to my repertoire. I get to add this to my quiver of arrows. You know what? That's a really great uh, point that you make there because everything has a silver lining, right? And everything has the positive and the negative to it. And even though we we're all in this time, you know, some people may have been in terrible health times and other people may have been in like elevated family times that they needed, or in your case, maybe elevated healing times. So there's always a silver lining to everything and everything has a positive and negative. So that's a great perspective to take on this whole close down of our country and everybody being into themselves for a minute or whatever that looked like for all of us. So that's, that's a great point you bring up. The other one thing I wanted to ask you about, you said you have not spent this much time with your wife in like forever. And is that, does she still like you? Surprisingly, yes. Uh, there have been, yeah, I'm not sure. going to lie and tell you that there haven't been some moments when I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is too much time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we certainly have had to walk <laughs> through some of those things and be like, okay, wow, we actually still like each other in spite of how mean we can be to each other sometimes. Yeah. Well, considering she's the balance, you know, we kind of need her around because. Yeah, well, I definitely, to, yeah, you, exactly. Yeah, you need to repeat this for your team over here. Yeah. So have you picked up any, <laughs> David, any new hobbies or anything, anything new that you're doing with the family or whether it's outdoors or puzzle making? Uh, yeah, I have, uh, I picked up playing the banjo, which I still suck at, but I'm at least getting better. Um, let's see, we've definitely done some, we've picked up some <laughs> new family things. I, I became the, when we started doing the um, schooling at home thing, uh, my wife kind of took on all the, the primary subjects, but I became the science teacher because I love good, I love good choice. Science. Good choice. Life. So yeah, I, we've been doing some cool experiments. We uh, actually um, rescued some quail, some orphaned quail. 
that we're raising uh, right now. And we've done the whole life cycle of a frog. So we got, you know, got them from eggs through the tadpole stage and um, managed to not kill a couple of them and let them go in the pond. So yeah, we've been, we've been really enjoying some outdoor stuff and some animal activities. Uh, we have chickens now, which are still not laying eggs. I had no idea how long it takes to grow, to raise, not grow, to raise egg laying chickens. Um, we have managed to keep all the animals alive, but I've also managed to kill all the plants. We try to do gardening this okay. year and we've had kind of a crazy up and down season in terms of weather uh, where it would get nice and warm and then I would take all the protections for the plants off and then it would frost again. So my garden looks awful, but the chickens are still alive. So it's been good. So just for a personal note, because I'm thinking of getting chickens here on my property in Georgia as well, how long does it take from to raise them into egg laying chickens? I'm just curious, yeah. do you know? From so what I'm finding out because I thought I was gonna have eggs by now is from buying the chicks at the, at the feed store to laying is like six months. So I'm like, man, I didn't know I was getting into this. I wish I would have, well, I still would have done it even if I knew, but I was not ready uh, at the beginning. The kids gotta love it, right? The kids oh, gotta yeah. love the, they're uh, the chicken. They have, a, they have a name for each one. Some of them look really similar. So it's hard to tell them apart, but they, they, they seem to know them how to tell them apart. I'm like, I have no idea which one that one is. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Let me ask you this. What's, what is the best lesson or realization you've learned in the past, in the past few months? I mean, you give me a couple of examples of family time and balance, but is there anything else that uh, you've realized or a great lesson by being kind of stuck for three months or, you know, stuck inside for a long period? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I've learned uh, is just the fact that we, um, <laughs> I kind of realized that this idea that we have in our society of control is sort of an illusion, where we think that we're in control of a lot more than we really are. And so, so much of life, so much of people's anxieties and stresses come down to trying to control every little thing that they can. Uh, or actually trying to control more than they can. And the reality is we're not in control. That's what COVID showed us as we're like, we're all like, yeah, we're going to keep doing business as usual. And COVID said, no, actually you're not. And that's been really hard for everybody in this country. So um, like the, the thing that I've walked away from that is just realizing, okay, I'm actually not in as much control as I thought I was, but um, that means I can let go of some of this stress and anxiety that I had about the things that I thought I was in control of. So you kind of just embrace the fact that you're not in control and you take the small pieces of things that you can control. Like I can only control how I feel about this situation that I'm in. I can't control the situation that I'm in, obviously, but I can control how I'm going to feel about it and how I'm going to react to it. So that's been one of my biggest takeaways from this whole COVID thing It's like, okay, just take it one day at a time. And, and like you said, try to put a positive spin on it, on everything that you can. And uh, at the same time, don't try to be delusional about it. Don't say everything is butterflies and rainbows when it's not just admit, Hey, this kind of sucks, but I'm going to get the, the best I can out of it. Well, you know, I have some bad news for you. As you get older, you realize that you're in control of nothing. <laughs> you might nothing. Get, you know, I, no I, thing. Yeah. <laughs> at, 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 yeah. At least you can kind of tell your kids bedtimes at 10. But trust me, that all, all that changes. So <laughs> that's a realization, man. That's good stuff. So how are you taking care of your mental health and your physical health uh, while being locked in, sequestered for these past couple of months? Honestly, my I, I, I hate to sound like a parent right now, but my biz, biggest suggestion for everybody is try to control your screen time as much as possible and your alcohol intake. Those are the two things I think everybody, everybody's nodding their head. I can see you guys all on the Zoom right now because it's so easy to pour another drink and watch another movie or watch another show. And it's just like, I, I'm a professional athlete and I have caught myself doing this. So I know that everybody else is, is having this, what, what are we going to call it? The COVID, COVID struggle. Everybody's got, everybody has put on the COVID-19, 19 pounds of beer drinking weight for sure. So just like find some silly projects to do. If you're stuck at home, 
then find some projects to work on that you that you can work on rather than watching more TV because it's really easy to keep hitting the next button on Netflix. I, I'll tell you that much. And it's really easy to pour yourself another beverage. But um, if you find things to do um, that are that are safe and fit the guidelines and can get you outside, it's going to do wonders for your health. My family and I started just doing a daily bike ride and. Some days it, it lasts an hour and some days it lasts five minutes, but we force ourselves in the evenings, no matter how crazy of a day we've had, no matter how many different Zoom conference calls I've had or phone calls with sponsors or whatever, we go out and do our bike ride. And um, it's just been a really good reset for us. It's like, okay, everything else shuts down and we go ride our bike around, bikes around the block and everybody, everybody in the neighborhood knows, oh, look, the wises are out for their evening bike ride. And that's just been super healthy for us. So yeah, find something. Find something to do rather than watch more TV and start pouring yourself some nice smoothies or uh, protein shakes or something rather than turning to alcohol because it's really easy to do. You know, that's super funny. I want everybody on this call to have heard that because he's a training Olympic athlete that is home drinking during COVID too. So all guilt is gone right now. We have no guilt in the room, okay? So anyway, um, you know, David, you're an awesome guy. And I love the way that you pose your family as your balance. And I love the way that everything that you do and everything that creates you is with, has to do with your, your family, your wife and your children and, and the way you were brought up. And that's extremely inspiring. I have one more question for you. And here it goes. What do you consider your greatest victory? Oof. That's a heavy hitter. Um, Don't worry, you won't hurt her feelings if you say it's, you know, that gold medal. You know, she'll be all right. <laughs> no, honestly, yeah. You, you, the reality is the more gold medals you win, the less they matter to you. And I don't want to minimize them because um, my competitors would, would probably just burn with fury to hear me say that. But um, I think that everybody has this idea that if, you, that if you achieve a certain level of success, then you're going to be happy. Or if you buy a big enough house, then you're going to be happy. Um, or in terms of athletic success, if I reach the top, then I'm going to be happy. But having been at the top twice, I recognize that being at the top didn't make me any more happy than anything else. And the things that made me the most happy had to do with the people in my life and had to do with the experiences um, I honestly thought it was cooler bringing an Olympic gold medal home and sharing it with people than I ever did having it myself and, and carrying it up onto the podium. Um, so yeah, my greatest victories is for sure. I mean, I, I, fortunately I'm the guy being interviewed so I can answer the question however I want. So I'm going to say it's a tie between finding the woman of my dreams and keeping two children alive. Um, I always, we, we had a friend who just had a, a one-year-old birthday party and I was like, man, you guys made it. They're still alive. And I kind of feel that way about my kids because they, early on, they were, I feel like they were just trying to throw themselves down the stairs and stick their fingers in outlets and stuff like that. So my greatest accomplishment definitely has to do with my family for sure. And you know what? It's funny, even as adults, we're still trying to throw ourselves down the stair <laughs> stairs and sticking our fingers in outlets, you know? So that yeah. never changes either. Super cool, man. That's great. Listen, I think you're an awesome guy and I want to thank you for what you do. And I'm just wondering, I want to introduce Maddie because I can't see if anything has come up on the screen as far as questions are concerned. Maddie, do you have any questions from our attendees in the audience? We do. We have a couple. Um, Monica asks, did you always think about being a speed pro or did you ever consider another career, business, medicine, et cetera? Uh, yeah, good. that's a really good question. Um, I think as a kid, my future dreams were just written in bold professional athlete. It didn't necessarily say professional skier. I played football and baseball growing up. And uh, honestly, when I was like 10, 11, 12, I was more into baseball than I was into skiing. But then um, once I hit high school, all my friends grew and I didn't. And so I became, I went from being one of the small, one of the like 
faster, stronger kids on the team to being the smallest kid on the football team uh, to where when I would show up to practice, people would be like, what is that child doing here? Um, I was just a late bloomer. Now I'm now I'm six one and I have a hard time staying under 190 pounds. But when I was in high school, when I was a freshman, I was just over five feet and like 104 pounds with my with my clothes wet. So um, that actually is what kind of pushed me towards skiing in terms of athletics, at least, was because skiing is a finesse sport. It's it's not about um, how big you are compared to the other guy. It's about how well you can control your own body. So yeah, that's kind of what pushed me towards skiing. Um, and then when I was 19 and 20, uh, so when I turned 18, I told my old man that I wasn't gonna, I realized, Hey, I'm not actually a professional skier unless you're not paying for anything. So I'm either going to make it as a pro skier, or I'm going to move on with my life. So, um, when I stopped, I refused to let him pay for anything. I was like, I'm going to either, I'm going to do this thing as a pro, um, 18, 19, 20, I was just barely in the black. And there was times when I was like, huh, all right, I might have to find, I might have to move on and find a new job or go to school or, uh, so I've certainly had many times when I've contemplated other careers. Uh, and my sister actually joined the armed forces when she went to the air force Academy uh, she, and she's four years older than me. And so I, there was times in my life when I con considered, uh, joining the, joining the military and things like that. Um, and now actually, as I, as I age, uh, in my career and, and sort of, am one of the old guys in the game, um, I am looking at the backside of my sport too, because I can't compete forever. So, um, I have, I've started a program called, uh, men, uh, mental giants. And so I'm doing some like mental toughness coaching, kind of taking my story and the things that I've, that I've been able to, to sort of the tools and assets that I have from a long career competing in skiing and uh, sharing that with some younger athletes who are people that I recognize that have the skills and talents, but are getting in their own way mentally. So I love sports psychology uh, and I may may or may not, I'm not going to make any promises, go back to school and get, and get a psychology degree when I'm done competing and I have enough time. That's awesome. That's so inspiring. Um, another question to kind of just go along with that, how often and how many hours a day do you train or spend training? Yeah, that's kind of hard to quantify. Um, in the off season, I probably spend at least 20 hours a week training. Um, that's just between the gym and riding my mountain bike to stay cardiovascularly fit and, um, stretching and doing physical therapy on some old nagging injuries and all of that stuff. I would average it about average it out to about 25 to 30 hours a week, uh, in the off season. And then during the season, um, I'm usually training, you know, five to eight hours a day, six, five or six days a week. So um, and then you kind of throw on top people are like, oh man, that sounds kind of nice. Like you, you don't actually have to work that much, but then you think about the fact that that's just the thing that I do physically. And the other side of being a professional athlete has a, a lot to do with emails and correspondence and sponsor obligations. Um, I do a lot of public speaking in the off season to kind of help pay the bills and take me to the places that I want to go. So, um, yeah, it ends up being, it ends up, I, I certainly don't need more things to fill my time. So it really, it really is a full-time job. It's full-time for sure. <laughs> um, another attendee has asked, what can you share with those on the call um, that aren't familiar with Reno Tahoe um, and your favorite parts that they may not know? Oh yeah. Um, man, there are some really, um, just like anywhere in the world, uh, there are some best kept secrets, but Tahoe is just ripe with secrets. There are some really cool, amazing trails that you can hike and bike on. Um, there are like, we're just, we're just moments away really from anything that you want to experience here. If you go East, uh, there's like some hot, some desert wasteland, just amazing vast landscapes and everything to the West is forest. And lake and just mountain mountainous terrain uh, so we're kind of right here on on the edge between everything so 
Um, at the same time, I think the sort of what people don't realize about Reno is how cool downtown has become and downtown and midtown. Um, quite honestly, I've lived here my whole life. And as a young person, I didn't really like going downtown. And I, there was not really such a thing as midtown and, and going out to eat was laughable. Um, but man, the, just the, the strides that the city has made in the last 10, 15 years um, towards progress in that front is amazing. And now um, I take people who are from New York City out to eat and they're like, wow, we are impressed by this. And so that's saying something, you know, for, for uptight people from the, from that side of the country to say that is, is cool. So um, there's a lot to discover here and you, you have to see it for yourself. <laughs> that's definitely true. And so much of it is so new with the downtown developing that it's exciting to always see new things opening and things that weren't there before. Um, another attendee asked, what do you look forward to doing the most post COVID or post quarantine? Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, I haven't jumped. Well, I, we have a trampoline at our house, but it's like a Walmart trampoline, you know, where you, it's got the net around it. It's not very bouncy. So I haven't jumped on like a really springy, uh, the type of tra trampoline that you, you would train for my sport on in a long time. So um, me and my kids used to go to Woodward at Tahoe every Thursday. That was our, that was our thing. And so our weekly session at Woodward has been put on hold for a long time. I think that that's, that's the one thing, you know, I've talked a lot about getting outside and spending time with your family and, you know, finding the silver lining and all these things. Um, absolutely do all those things. But I think we all know there's certain things that we can't do that we're really looking forward to doing again. And that's one of them for me. That's so cool. You said your kids go with you. Do they do tricks and stuff on the trampoline as well? Oh yeah. I, I don't think they, I don't think they realize that I'm working. They're like, <laughs> Oh no, we're here for us. Th this isn't about you, dad. <laughs> That's fun. We did have Andy ask what is Woodward? And I'm not really positive either. So if you could share about that. That's a great question. Woodward is a giant action sports facility uh, pretty much has, if you want to, tr like, if you want to watch some YouTube videos of me and my sport, and if you want to do something similar to that safely, you go to Woodward. There's trampolines and foam pits. Um, they have these little roller skis. So you can actually roll down the ramps on these, on skis and jump into the foam pit. So it's kind of a safe way to get, to get the feeling that I am addicted to that weightless feeling where you're flying through the air without having the risk of impact and injury at the bottom uh, is what Woodward is all about. So even for myself, if I have a new trick that I wanna learn, I'll usually go learn at Woodward first because then if I land on my head, I'm still alive uh, and then I can build it up and get strong and, and take it to snow. That's cool. So no shattered femurs at Woodward. <laughs> what was that? No shattered femurs at Woodward. No, not, I'm not going to say, <laughs> no thing in life is perfectly safe, but it's about as safe as you can right. get in my sport. And it's open to the public and you can be in there jumping on the trampoline right next to me and some other professional skiers. So it's, it's a pretty cool place to check out if you're going to make the trip out to Tahoe for sure. That's awesome. Um, and then just kind of one more question. I know at the beginning we were joking a little bit that the kids might make a cameo appearance, but how old are the kids now? Uh, yeah, so they are about to turn six and nine. So it's 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 a fun time of life. Ma uh, my son Malachi, who's about to turn six, um, we just got him his first mountain bike with gears and stuff. So he's learning how to switch his gears. And just yesterday, he was realizing that if he puts it in you know, one, then he can climb up the hills really easily. So he's been kind of stuck with this old BMX bike that I gave him and the hills were always a struggle and he didn't really like to bike. Whereas, but yesterday we got him his new bike and he was so excited. The first thing he said this morning when he woke up was let's go for bike ride. So <laughs> That's fun. That energy is just so contagious at that age. Oh yeah. We're having, we're, it's not a, it's not dull times out here. That's for sure. Awesome. Well, I don't know that we have any other questions. 
Um, Sean, do you want to take it away? Right. Yes, I'd love to. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you, David. Um, you know, your words are, you have inspiring words and it's good to see your angle on what's happening and uh, a lot of tips you give on wellness and it's all about the outdoors and we could all use more than that and um, the closeness of your family. And at the end of the day, that's pretty much what it comes down to for you and for all of us. Um, but I wanna thank you. And I also wanna thank uh, um, the people that attended this, our colleagues and in our industry professionals that attended this event. And thank you for doing this with us, David. I know that you have a busy schedule and I'm glad we caught you during COVID-19 time as opposed to, if it was another time, you would have been like, ah, sorry, Charlie, that ain't yeah, happen. Yeah, no, but, not gonna happen, but you, you, you caught me at the right time. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening well, you, to all my long-winded answers. And um, certainly, certainly as things start to get back towards normal, not too normal, but towards normal, we just look forward to seeing you guys out here in Reno, Tahoe, for sure. Perfect, perfect. Well, I want to thank you all for attending Reno Tahoe's first virtual event with local, national, and international heroes, personalities, and celebrities. Uh, I want to remind you all of our bounce back uh, offers and all other resources will be shared with all the participants of this post this event. Please tell your friends and colleagues about us. Our next event will be with our Reno mayor, Hillary Shivi. Hillary will give us her perspective on all things Reno and the nation on a political front. Uh, for now, everybody have a good evening and make it a great Reno sunshiny day. <laughs>